Wonderful. I just started the recording. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for being patient with me. And I was just explaining the Breathe program got started a couple of years ago when we did a report identifying several areas in East Baton Rouge Parish where there were higher instances of childhood asthma. Uh, we recognize there are higher, there's a higher burden of childhood asthma in areas where um, there are known sociodemographic and environmental factors in play, which are known to contribute to the asthma burden. Nationwide, we know that um, areas which are more um, primarily African-American, Hispanic, high poverty levels do tend to be more affected when it comes to looking at the asthma burden and especially the childhood asthma burden. And asthma being something that is affected so much by environmental factors, um, we really wanted to kind of take a take a bird's eye view of this. We didn't want to make it something where we just focus on telling people to go visit their doctors and leave it at that. We really wanted to kind of work this comprehensively. Um, and so for a year in 2020, we uh, spent some time with the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. They are a national nonprofit who is a very, very close and important partner in this program. And they helped us kind of create this comprehensive breed asthma program that looks at asthma providing care um, both from the clinical mm. aspect and the environmental aspect um, and really focusing on education um, but also at some point we would like to grow the program into being able to do more um, actual home remediation type of work but at the moment we're focused on education but the education does cover both clinical and environmental aspects and we are currently funded by a state environmental justice cooperative agreement by the EPA. And um, if you are wondering how your patients can, um, you know, uh, avail of our services. Uh, we have an online referral mechanism. Um, if you click this link, and these slides will be shared with you at the end of the um, presentation, um, you can click this link and it will take you to a, a very simple page where you just have to let, um, let us know who the patient is. Um, and their age, because if it's a child, we want to be able to have the parents' information. And we, what we do essentially is follow up with this patient and try and go through a clinical and environmental pre-screening. During that pre-screening, we check with, give me one second, I see a raised hand. Okay, go ahead, Danielle. I'm sorry, I can't hear your presentation. Someone's dog is in the background. Let me see if I can work this because they are definitely my dog, sorry. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, I, thank you. I, I am so sorry. Yes, uh, I did not realize, they were actually quite, quite a bit away. I did not realize that the microphone actually picked them up. Um, let me back up for a second. As I was explaining, the Breed Virtual Home Visits program, they're at it again, guys. One minute, please. better. Okay, yes. I'm so sorry. I never realized that this microphone is nearly so sensitive. <laughs> Okay, well, as I was explaining, so the Breed Virtual Home Visits Program is currently uh, funded by an EPA State Environmental Justice Cooperative Agreement. And um, what we do is provide virtual home visits, thanks to Tracy and her team. And if you have a patient who could avail of these services, what you need to do is go to this link. And it has a, it's a very simple form where we ask you for the patient's information, uh, name, age, because if it's a child, we would like the parent's information. Um, and we would like your information too. So if you're a community health worker, care coordinator, a nurse, 
um, we would definitely uh, like to know so that we can follow up with you and see, um, see if we can help you move that patient's care forward instead of it just ending with us. Um, and whenever we do get a referral in, what we do is follow up with the patient and get a clinical and environmental pre-screening form completed. Um, during this pre-screening, we identify exactly what are the needs of the patient. Um, and if they qualify for the virtual home visits, which is based on both severity of asthma, as well as how severe their home environmental issues are, um, we go ahead and schedule three virtual home visits um, with Tracy. Uh, Tracy does the first one. We also have physicians um, on our staff um, who assist. Um, and even if the patients don't qualify for the virtual home visits, we don't leave them alone. Uh, we still send them all the educational materials. And I will show you some information on that in just a second. Um, that way they still have that information and, and we follow up with them. We still give them a couple of asthma control tests. Um, and at the end of this whole process, we go through a final evaluation. Um, and just see how the patient's asthma and environmental situation is after the program. Um, did their knowledge levels improve and so on. So if you want to refer a patient to our virtual home visit program, here's the link. That's the way to do it. You can also call our hotline, 888 But we are here today because I would really also like for us to be able to do more in-person education. And there's a few, few reasons for this. One is that not everybody, especially patients in the rural area, have access to high-speed internet that's required for the virtual home visits. And so being able to have a wider network of people uh, that can do asthma education definitely helps uh, with reaching a wider pool of patients. And one thing we've learned during this whole process is that, you know, the face-to-face -face connections mean a lot to people, even if the face-to-face -face is just across from a computer. Um, but think about how much more powerful it would be if uh, this was like actual in-person face-to-face communication. And lastly, you know, sort of last but not the least is that currently we're funded by a grant um, and I hope that we can keep this up, but grant funding by its very nature is sort of an unstable source of money. Um, we would like to think of this program as something that can be sustainable because we don't want our, you know, the, the people of Louisiana, the children of Louisiana to lose the service just because, you know, priorities at the federal level change and at some point they don't want to fund um, asthma programs anymore. And so the way I envision how an in-person education on the breathe framework would work. Um, and you know, this is sort of the, the diagram below is sort of how I envision it, but certainly this is this is this would be something that we would work closely with each individual organization to be able to make this work for you. But the way I see it is that we get referrals for patients, but CHWs, care coordinators, nurses, see patients all the time. They might see them in a clinic setting, in a home setting, you know, all different kinds of places where y'all work. And all of our materials are available online that I will show you again in just a second how you can access it. Um, and the link to where all of this information is, is right on this slide. It's ldh.la.gov slash breathe. Um, and, you know, all of these materials let you screen and educate the patient using the BREATHE framework. And then you can just simply email us the forms. We can create fillable PDFs for you that you complete and email back to us. Our email address is breathe.la.gov. It's going to be um, on the, it's going to be shared. So you'll have access to that as well. And then we do all of that data entry in a centralized data management system. We do all the follow-ups and then we are happy to share this data back with you. So you, you know how your patients are doing and you can see the impact that you're making in the lives of the patients. 
So I just mentioned that all these breed resources are on the website, that the link is on the slide. Um, and so here's, here's just a screenshot from that web page. You can see all our survey questionnaire and educational materials that we have available. And the arrows, you know, you can see that the pre-screening survey, that's on the website. The first home visit survey, asthma control test, and you, you'll hear more about that today, uh, the pre-intervention knowledge survey. survey. All of these can be done in person or virtually um, by community health workers, nurses, um, whoever um, is seeing the patient. And then- well, what, right now, is there a Can question? Go ahead. No, okay. Well, and I see that Sharina uh, commented in the chat that uh, you love the idea of the fillable uh, PDFs and uh, communication across uh, agencies. And I love that too. Um, and yes, you will receive a copy of the slides um, at the end of this presentation, along with the link to the recording. Um, great. So. Uh, I was just pointing out how you could do the pre-screening, the first home visit survey. This is just to kind of help you guide the asthma education piece, asthma control test, and the pre-intervention knowledge test, which helps us sort of check gain in um, patient's knowledge, pre and post intervention. You can do all of these when you meet the person um, in the clinic or the home setting. Um, and all of the educational materials that are referenced during this education bit, during the first home visit survey, are freely accessible uh, for you to download, print, share with the patient, um, however, however you need. And then the follow-ups, right? So the follow-up home visit surveys, the post-intervention knowledge survey, the program evaluation, we can certainly come back from LDH's side and do these collect that information and share it back with you. So I talked a lot about how you can use the BREATHE framework to do asthma education, um, but I did want to touch a little bit on why use the BREATHE framework, because certainly this is not the only thing in the universe that you could use, right, to, to train your um, to train your, your colleagues or to teach asthma education uh, or asthma management techniques to your patients. Um, but I think that using the BREATHE framework has a few strengths that um, you, know, you, you, you may not be able to find elsewhere. For one thing, this whole framework was developed over a year with technical assistance from the experts at Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Uh, they kind of help programs um, across the nation develop how to make good frameworks for asthma, healthy homes, managing the environment, um, all of this good stuff. Um, and the other thing is BREATH provides you with all the materials that you need to be successful in educating the patient on asthma. Uh, we help you evaluate the patient's need through the pre-screening survey. We provide you with all the materials and sort of a guide in the form of that first home visit survey document. Uh, so you can educate them about all the critical points um, in the clinical and environmental management of asthma. And then finally, we also have a system developed to evaluate how effective that education was um, because everybody likes to know that they've made a difference and certainly if we weren't making a difference, we would love to know that too, so we can do things better, right? Um, and then finally, uh, you get a lot of support from LDH. Uh, we have a centralized data management system that is behind the Office of Public Health firewall, um, and we help you with uh, data entry support, with patient follow-up support. And what this helps is make that data standardized so it is comparable across organizations. Um, and also, this is a great way for you to get updates anytime without having um, to put in your own resources staff capacity in order to um, get those updates. Uh, we can even make these updates on a monthly basis for you. Um, this, th these can be things that you know we can we can discuss what works best for you. Uh, one idea I had in terms of updates is creating a dashboard that you can view. That's your private link, and uh, you can see how your patients are doing. Um, so you get a lot of support through LDH, but 
there's also some very direct benefits for your patients. For one thing, uh, the uh, OLOL Children's Hospital, their uh, parent foundation, is donating asthma telehealth kits to all virtual home visit participants. And we can certainly make these available to patients who receive in-person education too, as long as supplies last. Um, and these virtual um, telehealth kits or asthma telehealth kits, uh, they come with a lot of really good stuff like spacers. You learn about them later today too, peak flow meters. Uh, these are things that help. So spacer helps the patient uh, use their medication correctly, make sure they actually get that medication into their lungs. Um, a peak flow meter helps the patient identify where they are in terms of asthma control. Um, and a lot of these things can be very, very helpful to the patient. There's also an oximeter in there. Um, so you can really see if uh, there is a problem with the oxygen level, which can help patients know when's the best time to go to, um, go to the emergency room. Although I wouldn't rely just on that, but it's a handy tool. Um, and, and then there are other things like, you know, uh, being a breathe participant kind of automatically gets you considered um, for Louisiana Housing Corporation's weatherization assistance program. Uh, if the patient is low income, we ask them if they're interested in this program and we connect with LHC to try and get them the help that they need and they're interested in getting. Uh, the BREATH program also works with other partners. LSU is one at the moment uh, where we are thinking of studies and future programs on how to actually do things to improve the indoor environment. So we're working on a project with LSU right now, for instance, to see if um, using a dual HEPA filtration system uh, can help improve the indoor environment um, and reduce asthma symptoms. Being a brief participant gets you automatically considered to be asked whether or not you're interested in participating in this program. Uh, whereas these kinds of things may not be available if you are not in brief. And finally, as I was mentioning earlier, we have an amazing resource in Tracy. Uh, she's a respiratory therapist and asthma education specialist. And uh, we have physicians on call um, that you can receive a lot of support from. If you have patients that you work with, but then you realize that, um, you know, they really need more than what I can offer, send them our way. We will be happy to call them and help them out however uh, they need. And so I hope that that kind of helps you see the benefits of using the BREATHE framework um, to provide in-person asthma education as a CHW, as a nurse, as a care coordinator who works in a clinic or home setting. Um, and with that, um, I'm happy to turn this over to Tracy, who will go through sort of the meat of this, this webinar or this call uh, where, you know, you should really go through the uh, ins and outs, the depths of asthma education and how you can do asthma education. Um, and before I let Tracy um, start her piece, let me pause for a second um, and let me let me see if there are any questions. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and chime in or you can put your question in the chat. Let me unmute myself there. Okay, so not, can y'all hear me? It still says I'm muted, even though I unmuted. We can hear you. Wonderful, great. Um, oh, question about who's the partner in the, uh, who are the partners in the New Orleans area? We are partners with the New Orleans Health Department, um, but we're also trying to kind of expand our partner, um, partner organizations in the NOLA area. We're looking at community health centers, independent pharmacies, pretty much anybody that can help us reach patients. Um, and uh, if you you know, send me an email and I'll be happy to kind of connect you with folks um, who, can, who can help. Um, one of the things I will say is that we are actively looking um, for referrals and partner organizations who can send in referrals. So if you have ideas on how we can do this better, I am all ears.
Any other questions? Okay, so um, with that then, let me turn this over to Tracy. Um, and again, guys, if you have any questions at all, this is meant to be interactive. It's meant to be reasonably casual. Um, and my dog seemed to have sealed that fate for us uh, by being super loud. Uh, <laughs> um, so please unmute yourself anytime, raise your hand. As Tracy is talking, I will moderate. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Um, and so if anything comes up, I am happy to pause. And so we can address it right there. All right, Tracy, all yours. Okay, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, and I'm, I'm good at one-on-one -on -one, and this is really new for me. So. I hope I can get across to you and make it simple, but enjoyable. Um, I, I am an asthmatic and I actually lost my grandmother when I was six years old. She was 62 years old, Mary Hurst, and she passed away from asthma. And it's a, in my family, I have a cousin who's a nurse who has a lot of trouble with asthma. I, I fortunately haven't had as much, but I'll go ahead throughout the PowerPoint and share some of the um, things that I've come across as a mother with my children and, um, and just in my career, what I've learned. And, um, it, and there's a lot to be learned about asthma. It's not as simple or easy as everyone thinks. Um, your environment has a lot to do with it. Your immunity and your, your, your food has a lot to do with it. So I'm very much into uh, the holistic person as far as every part being addressed and, um, in, in particular, the environment and how that plays a huge role in it. So I'm gonna get started. And as you have questions, please feel free to, uh, to at, you know, ask those questions. So some of our objectives today is for you to understand it's a chronic condition um, and to understand some of the symptoms, for you to learn the, the medications. And it's really easy. There's really just two medications, quick relief and controller. So we'll keep it very simple so you can understand and, um, and really get a, a good understanding of what's going on. We're gonna talk about how to take the medication properly, um, some of the triggers in a home and how to change that and make that home a healthier home. Um, what is an asthma action plan and why would it be important for that patient and um, how to handle a flare up. Um, but I will tell you on that part, it plays a role in what that physician says on that asthma action plan. And then uh, just on the whole, creating an asthma friendly environment. Um, so when we talk about asthma being chronic, I was a respiratory therapist and still am. And I used to think asthma came and it went. They would have an attack and then it would go away. And that's basically... Uh, uh, what I thought for a very long time until my boss took me on the side and started talking to me about becoming an asthma educator. And the biggest thing that I took away from it was asthma is when there is swelling in a person's lung in that bronchial tube every day, even when they don't have symptoms. So a lot of times parents think they understand the child's asthma because when they look at their child, oh, they're not breathing, you know, they're not wheezing, they're not having any struggle right now, but that little bit of swelling and irritability is in that tube, even when there is no symptoms. So if you can just think about that, um, many, when I first started in the asthma education, I would get a lot of uh, articles on children across the world that died from it. And most of the parents that were in those articles said they never knew it was so bad and their child would have flare ups, but they would give treatments and they would get better. But no one talked to them about what did the medication do and why the treatment worked, but then it didn't work. And so we're going to kind of go into that. In the airway, in the slide that you're looking at now, there's only three things that can happen. There's swelling, there's um, increased mucus production, because when that tube gets irritated, it is gonna make snot like your nose. And that's what I tell the patient. Did you know your lung makes snot like your nose? And then as that tube swells internally and makes the snot, 
those bronchial tubes are wrapped with somewhat like smooth muscles called that they're smooth muscles all around the outside. It's like a rubber band. So I kind of tell the patient it's like a straw with rubber bands around it. And when that straw gets irritated, it swells more, makes the snot, and then the muscles around it will pinch the tube. And that wheeze is actually the air flowing through that pinch tube. It makes the wheeze noise. So, you know, you're like, hey, what are we going to do for the patient? Well, the patient, and let's see, the there's the changes, those three things. And I kind of go ahead of my slides. I'm sorry about that, but those slides are there for you and you can show your patient. You can take a coffee straw and then you can take a straw that's bigger and show the patient. The differences in those straws is huge. And, um, and it kind of gives them an idea of what you're talking about. The next slide um, goes over some of the symptoms. So when that tube swells and makes that snot, you and that, and then the muscles start to tighten, the child or that person will start to breathe fast and they will also start to cough. By the way, um, one of the most overlooked symptoms in asthma is that coughing in the middle of the night. So, mo you know, I did, a, I did a little research on my own for three months. 60% of my patients were given their children cough syrup. And so cough syrup is a suppressant. So what does that mean? It actually, the brain, it inhibits the body from coughing. So the child will go to sleep at night and they have a better night of sleep because they don't cough. But then what happens is the mucus buildup in that tube gets worse. And when that child wakes up, they'll come to the hospital and they're really hypoxic and breathing hard. And, you know, the whole time, it's just because there was a lack of understanding of what the child's symptoms were and what they needed to do. So the cough in the middle of the night should not be occurring more than two times in a month. So that is something really to think about and for that patient to have a conversation with their physician about because as we go on in the education, you're gonna realize how do you recognize that the patient probably needs more than just an albuterol treatment or an inhaler. So let's go ahead and we'll look at the next slide. Um, sometimes there are early warning signs. Um, I think one of the funniest that I've noticed with some of my patients, whenever the, um, the, the trach and all the bronchial tubes start to swell, sometimes the children will get itchy in their throat and their chin area. And um, I was really surprised that a lot of my patients did say that, or a child may say their stomach hurts. They'll never ever say their lung hurts because it's just not typical to say that. Or um, the runny nose and sneezing. So the allergies may start up here and then the dripping and all that will migrate lower. So dealing with what the child or the person is having up here is very important because it's gonna drip and affect this. Uh, sometimes the children's red and watery eyes is just a sign of that allergy. Or maybe that child is feeling more tired, when that lung swells, they're going to use more energy to breathe. And so it wears them out and they're going to sleep a little bit more or just lay around quietly. And that may be odd for some of the little boys and girls that are so active. Um, change in behavior where they're maybe not eating as much or just they don't sleep as well. It's always better to tell a parent to give albuterol sooner rather than later. Um, and I tell parents that. Um, the side effects of those al of the albuterol will go over and uh, make sure you understand what is that drug doing and what are the side effects of it. So it's really easy. Three things happen in the lung and there's only two medications for these patients, rescue or quick relief med. And those medications will loosen the bands that are around these tubes. And um, they last for about four hours when you give them. And that's really important to remember as we move forward in this lecture. Um, also controller medications. Those medications are meant to be taken every day and they're gonna affect the swelling in the tube. If, I'm a, if the, my doctor gives me a controller med, then I'm gonna take it every day. And I wanna try to make the inside of my tube look like this 
So these muscles around it will not pinch as severe or as often. It can still happen. You can still be on a controller med and end up having a flare up, but it may not be as severe or as often as it would have been if you're not on that medication. So let's just keep going forward. What are the quick relief meds? Well, the, the, it's really albuterol and albuterol is in different forms from different companies, but it's the same medication. Um, and you can see in this picture here that the inhaler in, in Zobinex is, a, um, is, is doing the same thing. It's a Saba. It's used more for people that have heart conditions because it'll not increase the heart rate, but it's really pricey. So you won't see as much coverage on that medication except for maybe children that might um, have heart of, um, defects and things. That medication, what it does is it relaxes all of those muscles, those rubber bands on those straws. It just relaxes them. And um, if you're using that drug more than two times in a week, you really should be talking to a physician because the reason those muscles are continuing to do that is because of the swelling in the breathing tube and that drug does not affect that swelling. So you'll see patients that maybe have two different inhalers, but they don't really understand them or they don't really know what are they really doing. The physician gave me these inhalers. And pretty much that's what I see across the board is we don't slow down in the medical field to really get into detail with this. Um, I'm sad to say this, but a good friend of mine um, is from Germany and she's an asthmatic. She's also a respiratory therapist um, here. And she said when they were diagnosed in her country, they had to go to class. And I thought that that made a lot of sense that when your child gets a diagnosis, you know, you go to class to learn about it so that, that it's easier on the child and their quality of life is better. And so um, I do think like with the albuterol, there may be a lot of overuse but I think that it's because they don't do it appropriately. And then there's maybe a lot of underuse where they could be using it for that cough instead of doing the cough syrup. So just the quick relief med or the rescue med is albuterol. By the way, guys, the breathing tr treatment that people take, that is also albuterol, just a different form. So, you know, you're going to get probably a lot of questions about is the treatments better than meter dose inhalers? Well, the research that's out there shows that meter dose inhaler is just as good as, uh, as a treatment if done, uh, done properly. And we're gonna tell you how to do that today. So this is one medication for asthma, but let's go ahead and you should always have the quick relief med. The other meds are called, let's see, uh-oh, uh -oh, I missed one, Runa. How do I go back? Is she there? Tracy, hey, there is I... an arrow on the bottom left. Can you see that where my mouse is right now? So if you look on the right, oh, bottom, yeah, sorry, yeah. bottom right. Yep, click on that arrow and that should do it. Oh, okay. So the other meds are controller meds. And basically guys, what is it controlling? The swelling inside the breathing tube. So we're just, be, we're just fighting inflammation. We're fighting swelling. And you know, really in the human body, Inflammation in any part is different things. It's inflammation in the pancreas, diabetes, inflammation in the lung, asthma, inflammation on the skin, eczema. So a lot of our patients that do have asthma also have eczema. Those things a lot of times go hand in hand. And it's just that that, that body doesn't like certain things. Um, and, and a lot of times my patients just don't recognize it. Also food allergies. Just the body is not like liking certain things and it's individual to each person. But the, um, the controller meds, the way that they're different is when a patient is ordered on a controller med, they have to understand that medication needs to be done daily because it builds up in the bloodstream and over about a two week period, it builds up high enough to start getting the effects of the swelling going down. If the patient goes home with like a flow vent, they, and they don't understand it, they may say, well, I'm having an attack. So let me take this flow vent and albuterol together. 
But what they didn't understand was that flow vent needed to be done daily so that it could work. And if they weren't doing that, it's probably too late at that point for the effects of that medicine to happen. So the controller meds are just really different, but they're simple and they're not, um, they're not hard to understand. What are the side effects? Most of the time, what patients that or my parent patients parents worry about is the steroid affecting the growth and in, in of that child. For inhaled steroids, you see very little side effect. But um, and it's actually better in the research papers that I've read to take inhaled a little bit every day to keep the irritability down than to have to take oral or IV steroids. So I try to encourage the parent, does it mean that the person is on it for the rest of their life? No, it doesn't mean that. Um, they can, their tubes, as their body grows for children, their tubes will grow and, and the, it gets better. But if they're true asthmatic, the swelling is always there. And um, I spoke to a 35-year-old yesterday from New Orleans who was doing albuterol three times a day. And I was like, oh, it's not really good. And he's like, I, I'm having to do it to breathe. And I'm like, well, you have significant swelling and I suggest you need to go to your doctor because the reason you're having to do your albuterol is, is due to what's inside that, that bronchial tube. And basically after we finished our session, um, he said at 35 years old, no one in the state of Louisiana or anyone in the medical field had broken the asthma down to him where it made more sense. So this is Hello? what, oh, yes. Oh, I'm so, okay, I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to answer the call come through and then I messed up the presentation. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Okay. So um, we're going to move on from controller meds on how to get the medication. So this is like really, really important because, um, uh oh, let's see, it moved. Um, oh, yeah, we can go, we can go to this side understanding what a canister is. And I actually have one here. I'm a very visual person. Oh, we could go back. Let's see, Runa. Uh-oh. Give me a Sorry. second, Tracy. It looks like we got... We were actually on how to give the meds after the controller med one. Yeah. What's the is this next... It? Yeah, the next slide. Let me see. Yeah. So, um, so if you always do whenever you take inhalers. Now, guys, you want to remember if it's a powder inhaler, it is different. And on in the realm that I'm in with children, I don't see much of the powder medications. And what I will tell you is when you talk to the patient and they start to tell you about their medication, you need to look at it and, and decide, is this powder or aerosol? This would be more like an, an aerosol for me is what I call it. And, and it, it doesn't have the fluorocarbon in it. They changed that in the last few years, but it has propellant or filler and the med actually floats on the top. But like there is a pro air click device that when the patient opens it, it clicks, it's a powder. So the way they take the medications will be determined by if it's an aerosolized or if it's a powder. So I just want to say that at the very beginning, this book that you're looking at, it's, it's a book that we sent and we created, it deals more with the pediatric population. So when you get into the powders and the aerosols, I will go over the difference in taking them. And um, just so you'll have that in this, in this recording. But when I, get, um, when I get my inhaler, I should also get a spacer with it. I have, during this project, have had patients that they go to the pediatrician, the pediatrician orders an inhaler of albuterol, but does not give them a spacer. When that occurs, 
um, the usage is, is like probably less than 20% is deposited in the lung. So it's very, very low of getting the med from here to down into here. So I hate to tell you that, but that's about the truth of it. If they're not using a spacer, most of the medicine will end up in the throat. When you give it, it's always better to be sitting up nice and straight or standing just so you get a good pathway um, from the mouth and the angle of the throat into the lung. It's always better if their head is not too high or if they're not too low. So just a nice straight chin. And the reason is you're creating a pathway for the med to travel down the throat and get down here in the lung. So it's just really important that the position is good and that you have a spacer. Now, I'm gonna show you two ways of giving it. And I'm actually gonna start off like, I'm gonna, like an adult would take it. So the spacer looks like this. If you have a population that they, they don't have a spacer, they don't have money because they're, they're, they're pricey, like some are 30, 35 bucks, you can make one out of a water bottle and literally take uh, the bottom of a water bottle and cut a hole in it for your spacer and then use where you drink at. You can do that. It's, you know, a MacGyver way, but it is doable. And if they would get more med like that, great. If they put it in their mouth, they can still take it because most of the time, if it's men, they don't have a purse. Women walk with purses, so they'll tend to have it more. But the men will just put this in their pocket and leave it like that. And uh, we'll talk about, you know, the seal and how they take it without it. But basically, when you get the canister, there's some knowledge you need to know about this canister. The propellant or fillers in it and your med floats at the top. So if a patient picks it up and just takes it, they're not going to get the med until the very end. So you want to do a good 10 second shake. There is a research article out that shows 35 percent less med is given when not shaken long enough. So I tell patients good 10 seconds. Also, when they pick it up from the drugstore, the, the, the canister needs to be primed because the first three to four puffs have no medicine. So if the mother gets it and the child's having an asthma attack and she gives those first three or four puffs, they don't have no med in it. She might end up in the ER because it didn't work. And it probably didn't because there's no medication in it. And so knowing that is taking out the fine print from the pharmacy and it's very small and reading it. But actually one of our slides does have what to do with the priming and all of that. So I got my medication. I'm just going to play like it's an albuterol and I'm going to spray this one four times in the air to prime it and it's ready to go. And so I always shake mine a lot because I want to mix it and get it. And I'm going to insert it in my spacer. And when a patient puts it in their mouth, you want to make sure their teeth is not in the way or their tongue. Um, probably 30 or 40 percent of my kids that open a mouth and use it, they're teenagers. And a lot of times they put it in front of their teeth. So the metal will just hit their teeth and never get into their lung. So I always like shake it to make sure. Are you biting on it? So I bite on it and I'm going to exhale first so that I can take a deep breath in and then I'm going to press. I will inhale slow and smooth and then I'm going to hold my breath for about 10 seconds. So it looks like this. And then when I release it, I'll just release it nice and slow. I don't want to, because what I breathe in, I'll just push some of it back out. So it's not rocket science. It's easy. When you inhale, the reason you have the spacer, let's like, why? Why do you have a spacer? So the med, and I want you to see it, it shoots really fast, okay? So if I put it in my mouth and shoot it, it's shooting fast. And the pathway is go into the throat, make a right-hand turn and get down into the bronchial tree. Well, 
all of you guys drive your car 100 miles an hour, come to a red light and take a right hand turn, you will go off the road. So the medicine goes into the back part of the mouth and it crashes. It never makes the turn. Look what the spacer does. The spacer, oops, sorry guys, the spacer pulls it back from this curve and it allows the speed of the medicine to slow down. And when I inhale, I'm inhaling slow and smooth. And then once I do that and pull it down, I'm gonna hold my breath to let it rain into the breathing tubes and settle. And then I'm gonna just let my air out nice and slow. And guess what? You have to wait a full 30 seconds before you press it again. If you do not, the medication you get by pressing it too soon will be a smaller amount. So many of the patients go home and this is what they do. <sighs> and they probably get like less than 20 or 10% of the med because they blowing back out what they took in. Plus they sucked in too fast and they didn't wait long enough in between. So all of those are issues when you're dealing with asthma. And that is actually the proper way to take a, an inhaler using a spacer and using an uh, MDI. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you now with children, because of the coordination factor, we just add a mass to that spacer. And this is one that you can, you put over their nose and mouth. And what you do is you still shake it. When you give it to the child, you want to make sure you have a good seal. There is a flap that moves when they breathe and you will see uh, the flap move. Let's see if I can show you on here. As I move it, you can see that flap go up and down, up and down. And so when the parent gives that puff, you just want to see the flap move six times, six breaths. When the child takes the breaths, some children like to help you. So they'll go... <laughs> It should not be a pant. It should not be <gasps> one and blowing out. <gasps> Let me see you take a deep breath and blow bubbles. Don't tell them that because blowing out is just pushing that med back out. You really want them to breathe normal. And if they could, you don't want to wait too long to give the med because if they get really short of breath, they're not going to get a lot of it. <gasps> okay, mom, I can't breathe. And they're really just doing this with the med. It's not really being pulled down into those tubes where it needs to be. So let's see what my next slide says. Um, okay, we went over this. Okay, and I'm gonna stop right now because I just wanna ask, does anybody have questions about canister medication and how to take it with a spacer? Does anybody have questions about that? A lot of times this is what you'll be telling them because they, the, nobody slows down with, with the patient enough to tell them. Now, I know in the pulmonary office, there's two respiratory therapists and their job is a lot of times to educate on in the nurses on understanding the controller med, the quick relief med and how they work together. Okay, so and how to give it is just really, really important. The other thing is the washing, you can wash the spacers weekly in warm soapy water, but you do not wanna put any brushes on the inside of it because the brushes will scrape the inside and actually make it less effective. So just some nice warm soapy water, Dawn dishwashing and set it, wash it, rinse it and put it on a towel and it'll, uh, it'll keep it you know, good for you. If the patient is doing it without a spacer, sometimes you could do a two finger thing where you hold open your mouth and it gives it a little bit more distance for the med to slow down. Um, but if they put it in their mouth, just please encourage them to inhale slowly. The slowness of it is what helps the turning of the medication. And you know that kind of goes into physics. I'm not great at physics, but I do know that particle size and speed and angles can all play a role in how that gets down here. So just, you know, when you when you're having trouble with it, you can go and I 
I will tell you this, um, there's some good resources already on the internet. Asthma Allergy Network is a nonprofit that I use a lot. Um, and also um, there's um, just a number of resources, but what I tell most of y'all is stay with the more reputable people. Um, there's Quad AI that the asthma allergy doctors have. Um, EPA is fantastic. And NIH has a lot of good stuff, but just watch who you do the videos with and where they come from, because you don't want to get the wrong information where that patient is receiving less of the medication. Um, and I know this slide says five seconds, but um, I've talked to manufacturers that actually recommend 10. So um, we're going to, I want to show you one other thing that you can use, um, and I will encourage you to get some. I get them every year and I give them out to the doctors. So let me show you what I have. It's this. So when you're talking with your patient, they're going to tell you stuff like, uh, hey, I have a red one or I have a blue one. Oh, I got an orange one. And they don't always know the name of it, but the Asthma Allergy Network put this together. And every year they update it. Um, and I have it on the wall in my office, but it tells you about the drugs. It doesn't tell the prime. And actually, I've, I've gotten with the organization and asked them to make a new one. That shows how many times that you need to prime it. And um, that way we could tell our patients and keep that in mind. But it's just, and this is in a book, but look, I'll show you. It's actually laminated and they're cheap. They're a couple bucks. And they're in Hispanic and they're in English and I love them. And it's just a laminated uh, paper. And it's actually got asthma action plan on the back of it. But it is good, and I use it with all my patients, and a lot of times they can just point out things. Let's just stop right now and kind of talk about the powder. If a patient has a powder, the difference in taking that medication is huge. Number one, um, the Digihaler by ProAir, which is this one right here, is a powder. And my patient yesterday had one. He didn't need a spacer. So guys, when you open it, it clicks. The powder in it, it is heavy. It's not like a little light aerosol. This aerosol particle, you gotta slow down with the speed because it's gonna bounce and hit the back of the throat, but the powder has to be picked up. So if I'm taking a powder, I'm blowing out first, I'm putting it in my mouth and I'm gonna suck fast to pick up that heavy powder and pull it down into my lung. And then I'm gonna count to 10 once it gets there to let it settle. And then I'll let my breath out. So powder is different. You wanna you want let the patient know not to blow out in the powder container because it can the moisture will affect it and not to keep that container in a high humidity area may not be good to keep it in the bathroom or even in your pocket if you're real sweaty because the powder can clump up. So that would be like my thoughts on the powder and, um, and you don't need a spacer when it's a powder, only when it's a canister med like this, meter dose inhaler. So the asthma population, when they go home, um, they should be given an asthma action plan. Um, it is the gold standard, and I don't know how many community health workers know this, but um, a long time ago, the government said, what can we do for the population? And they formed a board, and the board came together, and it was people from all over the country that were specialized in asthma, from the Jewish you know, Asthma Institute in Denver, all over the place they came together, and they said, let's form some guidelines. And the guidelines say when a person wheezes, everybody should go home with albuterol. But then if they use an albuterol more than a few times in a week, or if they're waking at night with a cough, then they probably need to be put on a controller med. So that's where step therapy came into be, being. And um, I'm not saying it's all great. Um, I understand step therapy, 
But um, I would like to believe that our physicians have the continuity if they feel a patient needs to go higher than one step, that they could do that because I am a firm believer in personalized medicine. So um, understanding what is in an individual's life can make a big difference. But the asthma action plan is actually a paper that is divided into the red, yellow, and green zone. And it is to help, let's see if I can go to the next one, um, the green, yellow, and red. It is to help a patient understand what needs to be done when what we call an asthma attack occurs, okay? And so that's just that flare up that can happen. And why does it happen? We'll talk about that in a second. But that asthma action plan is really good and it can help that patient recover maybe without going to the emergency room. Um, sometimes our patients will come into the emergency room and all they do is one big treatment and go home. And some of the things they could have done may have been able to be done at home safely if they had an asthma action plan. So here's like the paper. And you know, um, the hospital printers don't print with a color. So I am a big fanatic on coloring my patients so that they can understand it better. The green zone is simply the patient and the, where do they get this from, by the way? The physician should have this. The physician should fill it out and should send that patient home with one. The green zone is simply the patient's not having any symptoms, but if they were on a controller med, it needs to be done every day, it would be listed in that zone. So if it's Flovent two puffs a day, twice a day, then they should have it listed there. And then the yellow zone, the yellow zone means, hey, I'm having symptoms. And those symptoms could be wheezing, tightness of chest, shortness of breath, um, or waking in the middle of the night with a cough. And they're starting to see some symptoms. What am I to do for my patient? And it'll have the albuterol, how many pucks and how often to do it listed there. And then you have the red zone. So the red zone comes into play when you do the yellow, the albuterol here. The patient should get better and, and go back into this green area. But if you do the yellow zone and they're not getting better, then it goes, throws them into the red zone. And the red zone means they're going to the emergency room or go and see their physician right away. It is, um, and that's as simple as it can be. I think the, the worst thing I see and the, the thing that I like to do with the parents is I wanna help them feel like they can go home and see their child be safe. Um, I would be a nervous wreck if my kid couldn't breathe and I didn't know what to do. So how many treatments do I give? When do I know to give it? What's the logic behind it? Like, I need to know all of this. And so I want to break something down to you that our pulmonary doctors do. Um, one of the things we did about five years ago was we came up and said, let's do all of us do the same in the yellow zone so that our school nurses in East Baton Rouge Parish would not I have it so hard and our parents so we can have this, you know, talk. So basically, I want to share with you what our physicians do and why they do it logically. OK, you cannot give this to your patient. The physician has to write this. But I want to give you some logic behind what what goes on in that zone. Um, and in our yellow zone, what we do is we do four to eight puffs of albuterol every 20 minutes, three times. And I wanna tell you why we do that. If a person has gives a treatment and what you're gonna hear is, I gave my daughter albuterol and it didn't work. They got worse. Well, what happened? Am I lying to you when I tell you duration is four hours? What happened in the lung? Well, guys, this is what happened. When the pinching occurs, you see, those muscles are all on those bronchial tubes all the way to the bottom. If you turn it upside down, there's the trunk and here's the tree. So when I take out butyrol and, and, and I took it at 12 noon, it should last till four o'clock. But lo and behold, it's 1.30 and I'm short of breath again. What happened? Well, the pinching that happened I want you to think of the medication as a little bitty car driving into that tube. It drove into the tube and it hit a pinch. That's a speed bump. 
it slowed down. The next pinch, the car didn't make it over. So there was no depth of that drug going into that bronchial tree. So now my child or I am using, needing it sooner. What am I gonna do? In our yellow zone, we do three treatments. The first treatment, it'll open the beginning up and then the physician asks that you wait 20 minutes. So I tell my parents, set your phone. Then you're gonna do it again. It'll go into the middle, wait and let that effect occur and then do it one more time, beginning, middle, end. At that point, I just opened all of the bronchial tree branches. And if I get a good response, my child will not need it for four hours. But if my child needs it in one, two, or three, anytime less than four, I'm headed to the emergency room. At that point in our red zone, we can do albuterol every 20 minutes until the child gets a paramedic, an ER, somewhere you know where they're getting help. But a parent should never go home from a physician's office without albuterol and not know what to do when that attack occurs and that drug is not working. It is scary and um, it can be dangerous and they can die. And um, my story is a, a good friend of mine's son was 18 and actually was an asthmatic and he didn't show up at home and she found him in his car. Um, in the Walmart parking lot, college student um, with his albuterol and cell phone in his lap. He never made it. So what happened was his swelling was significant in his breathing tube. And I don't, not positive if he was on that controller med or not, but he went into Walmart to stock the shelves that were quite dusty. And that tube started to swell fairly quick. And even though there was an albuterol there, the albuterol could not get into the swelling part of that tube. And so it's the silent part of asthma that kills our population. And people think, well, I just use albuterol occasionally, but how do you know how much swelling your child has when there's no symptoms? Well, asthma can be diagnosed with a simple breathing test called a pulmonary screen or a pulmonary function. Many of my patients never have them. And I will tell you that. And it makes me sad because it can be done by the age of four and all the way up in life. And what they do is you blow out in a machine. It's not expensive. It's not invasive. You do a breathing treatment and you blow again. And the, if the second number is 12% higher then that first number, then you're an asthmatic. You have reaction to albuterol. And so some of our patients will see a 20, 25% increase. So how much does that patient have that test can tell? Those tests are mostly done in the peace population in an asthma allergy office or in a pulmonary office. Um, I will tell you, my general practitioner has done it on me in her office. And so sometimes with adults, it is done in that level. And then if they see you're, you know, pretty bad off, they'll send you to have a, a bigger test done because the pulmonary screen is just a small one, but then you can get into more detail with a bigger test. So, you know, that is how asthma is diagnosed. And a lot of times, you know, the physicians don't send them or that step is just overlooked, but it's just a very important step for us to be, uh, to do it right, really, um, in that population. Um, so there's a checklist I ask my patients, do you have an asthma action plan at home? Um, a good idea for the patient is to take a picture of it. Cell phone is here to stay. And I like it. Um, you could take a picture of it. I make my patients take pictures of their asthma action plan now and keep it in their phone because they'll throw the paper away and lose it. I tell them, put it on the refrigerator, tape it. That way, when you're at home, if something goes down, you have a plan. The person should have a plan when they have an attack so they know what to do logically and it can relieve them of some of the fears that they have that my child may not make it. Um, do they have a rescue inhaler at home? Is there an asthma action plan at school or daycare? Or is there a rescue inhaler at the school or daycare? And really that child that is real symptomatic should have those at both places, um, the spacers and all of that in place and ready to go. 
um, the breathe home visit questions and you're like, okay, where does it come into play? Well, it comes into play because the swelling part of that tube and the irritability um, is comes from triggers and triggers can be many different things. Um, the triggers can be your home, meaning maybe you're in an older home and maybe there's issues with dust or um, maybe there's mold issues. And um, I will tell you, I have three daughters. They're all in their 20s now. And we had 12 um, pneumonia wheezing episodes in their childhood, meaning under the age of 12. Um, I lived there till I was 40. And what happened was I kept bringing them back and I took the carpet out of it. I knew that much. And I kept cleaning the air ducts out. I, I put yellow gloves and I got as deep into my air ducts in that trailer to pull all the dust and dirt out. Windy units, we had that. I would clean it to make sure. But as I moved out of it, I noticed over four years, five years, no more wheezing at all. It was totally environmental. And um, since then, now that they're in their 20s, um, I've used I've used albuterol rare. Mine expires before I use it. And my second daughter is my allergy child. She has it. And she actually didn't recognize her cough the other day. And I had to tell her to take albuterol and it got better. So that cough aspect, that tickly dry cough is sometimes just fixed with albuterol. Um, our breathe home visit questions. We explain all of what I just went through to that patient. We go over the symptoms and we talk about what they see. Um, we talk about their medications and I personalize it to what, what are they on. Um, some people don't even recognize that the flow vent has three different doses and, um, the re and what, why does it have that? But it's, it has a lot to do with the STEP program. Um, we talk about the refills and, and adhering to the medication, meaning, or are you doing the controller med daily? If you do the controller med every day and you're still using albuterol twice a week or more, you're not on enough. That's as simple as it can be. And the reason the physician will ask you to come back every three months is they're trying to figure out if they have you on enough or not. There is such a huge missing of appointments in the pulmonary group and the allergy group. And, you know, and it's like they're constantly working on calling the patient and trying to get them to come in because the lack of understanding of what's going on is just not there. But you can make a difference in it. And, um, and, and all of us can just by working together. It, it's not going to be one respiratory therapist or one, you know, uh, Department of Health. It's got to be a group of us all working together. And everything you read about is about collaboration. It's not one person. So you guys are so needed to have conversation with these patients across the state and, um, and even understanding what the physicians need. You know, you can get uh, asthma action plans, fax them to the doctor, have them fill them out and send it back. And hopefully um, they, they know enough to do it. And if not, you know, you can get with um, and get, encourage them to go to specialists and ask their physician to refer them because um, sometimes that population isn't maybe referred soon enough. Um, I'm going, I'm keep going, Runa. So the triggers. So one really good thing about our project, and um, I'm really working hard to change some things about it. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm in the mud trudging through, but um, but the, the good thing is you're in a patient's home when you do the virtual and you really can talk about, hey, you know, what do you see around your home? And you would be surprised at uh, some of the comments that we get. Um, the triggers or in the biggest one is the secondhand smoke. Uh, the last case that I saw where a child was six years old and died, she was in a smoker's home. And um, I don't, I, I know smoking is a hard subject and I definitely don't condemn the population. I have my own issues with my weight and sugar. So, um, but what I would encourage is to try to keep the door open with that population, not make them feel bad or um, guilty about it. But there is a, a number that, the gov that we have, it's called 1-800-QUIT-NOW. It's a great resource, guys. 
it is such a great resource and sometimes there's funding at that resource for uh, for patches and gum and so and you can remember it 1-800 quit now i'll be an advertiser for them because i tell all my patients about it i try not to uh to make them feel guilty about it it's just a struggle and you know if you if what i found is with my weight I have to keep trying and um, keep trying. Same thing with, with secondhand smoke. It's better if they don't do it in the house, but if the house has already been smoked in, uh, it's kind of like a bad spot. Also cars is a big deal. Um, once a car is smoked in, you're never gonna get the chemicals out of it, but there's 60 chemicals that are cancer agents in that. And so just think of your skin and you have a rash on your skin. And every day you came and you rub that rash. Well, it's not going to be healing anytime soon. So when that lung swells and gets irritated, that those chemicals just keep that irritation up high. And, and they really just need to get away from it. It's, it's a hard thing. Um, the other common things that you'll see in a home is dust mites. So dust mites eat skin. That's what they do. And everybody has them. I don't care if you think you do or not, but you have them. The dust mites keep the skin the dead skin away and they eat it. And so they they can build up in pillows, in mattresses, in uh, stuffed animals, in old blankets children have. But the stuffed animals, if they can be washed, it's okay. You can also put them in a bag and freeze them and it'll kill the dust mites. Dust mites grow in homes that have high humidity. So a home that has humidity of less than uh, a, a 30 to 50% is good. But if a home has a high humidity, you'll see a larger number of dust mites in those homes. Um, I tell patients that um, HEPA filters come into play. Um, when you're dealing with dust mites in, in, in children, and even adults, the most important room you deal with will be the bedroom. That's where you sleep at the most and you're, you're spending a lot of time there at night, you know, hopefully they get good sleep. And so the bedroom is always the best place to start. Vacuuming with a HEPA vacuum. Um, and my and recently, um, my daughter's doing a project right now. She's, she's uh, working to become a child life specialist. And she's did a project on uh, the bedroom. And so we looked up the cost of some things for dust mites, uh, Runa, and I'll have to share you the brochure with you. Um, and the cost for like mattress covers can go anywhere from 20 to $29 from Walmart and Target. Um, pillow covers is like five to $7. I tell people, um, make sure it's good, meaning it should say something about allergies. Um, not everyone is is allergy prone. The the covers and the pillowcase mattresses. The other thing is washing sheets and hot water weekly will help. Um, having not a lot of clutter in the bedroom. If there's a lot of clutter, encourage them to pick it up and put it in bins like toys and things. The less clutter you have, the less dust you have. Um, if they have pets. Pets are not recommended for the asthma population. And I get them so many times talk about long hair, short hair, and I'm thinking hmm, it's just not recommended if you're allergic to it. And um, I know I'm not, I've been allergy tested and um, neither is my daughter, Jean. We're not allergic to cats and dogs. And I actually have, have both, my cat I recently I, I lost her, but I still have my dog. And, um, but if people have trouble with it and they don't, they can't get rid of it because pets are like family members. You can tell them to, to keep them out of the bedroom, keep them out of the bed. That would be like the simplest thing and, you know, and still keep the dog. But the highest recommendation is definitely no pets. Cockroaches, um, no one ever talks about it, but every, you know, the cockroach is, um, is something that, that has chitin in them and the body parts itself can irritate us. And actually, uh, even if they die in the ceilings and walls and they're not alive, they're not good for our lungs. And so if a person is in an apartment and they bomb it and get rid of them, but then another person moves in and I'm like, oh, I don't know what's going on. It could be like a cockroach issue. So cockroaches are just not good to have. So storage containers and making sure you don't leave food uh, laying around is what I tell them. You know, get things picked up in your kitchen. Don't leave the plate of food overnight by the sink because it's going to draw that. So just keeping that clean and um, 
they can use, um, I know boric, um, boric acid is like a powder. You can actually buy it at Walmart. You can put that around the outside of your house, but it's better like to try to do sticky traps versus sprays because those sprays that are so, they're chemically oriented and they can actually irritate the lung. So the way that all of that's done needs to be taken into consideration, especially, you know, as the person's living in that house, um, I wouldn't recommend to, to just bomb it and then you, you go right back into it because those chemicals can be irritating to the airway. Um, mold, well, mold is, is something that um, a lot of the people have and they don't talk about. I don't, you know, people rent things a lot in Louisiana and they, they have mold issues. Um, Kilting a wall with paint doesn't get rid of the mold. It really has to be remediated properly by cutting out the sheetrock and making sure it's not on the beams and things like that. And if it's not done properly, that mold will keep returning. And so um, I talked to the population about that. Um, there are programs and Runa, I, I so applaud the Department of Health. This project is just really starting in our state and in some states like Philadelphia or the city of Philadelphia, they have homes that they go in and they fix. And to me, this is my heart. Like, you know, you're a single mom and you can't afford to move around a lot. It's terrible. Like last year, you know, I had a mother have a hot water heater in her apartment break. And the apartment people just vacuumed it up and didn't even like remediate the lower walls or anything. And she has three kids. So it's like some things, you know, about the things that are happening, the only way we're going to be able to change it is by getting information, which is what this project does, showing it to our government officials and say, hey, we need to change something. But all of you guys come into play, all of us. And so we can do that with this project. And it's just, it's really like in the workings, it's just beginning. And we need a lot more people like you guys that are with the patient out there in the community. Community workers is such a big part. Um, the mold aspect, it, I'll talk to the parents, you know, making sure that the pipes are not dripping and then the landlord aspect and, you know, don't tell anybody, but I did call somebody one time and say, hey, so I just I get with asthma. Could you please try to fix your apartment? Because, you know, um, it, it can cause trouble for them. And um, it's terrible if a mom has to keep going to the emergency room because they live in the wrong place. And um, I'm very passionate about this. And um I was the owner of some rental properties, but I wouldn't rent it to you if I wouldn't live in it myself. And that's just my own ethic about it. Um, the strong odors. So what I found about strong odors is um, bleach can be a big deal. And I know everybody was cleaning with bleach and this project is fantastic. Bleach actually isn't good for the environment. And a lot of people were cleaning with that because of COVID. This project addresses how do we kill the COVID virus, but not use bleach. You can do it, guys. And we got some slides coming up and I'm way ahead of myself, but we'll get through quicker. But there are things that we can do that you don't have those strong odors. Also, candles, incense, um, sprays. So um, I'll tell you what happened with me in a patient's room. Um, I had a body spray, light body spray, that's because I like just something light of Dahelia. And every time I walked in the patient's room, they sneezed. This is no lie. Every time. And I, I said, gosh, you know, I wonder if it's something I have on. And basically, when I looked it up, Dahelia is a flower. So then I had to quit wearing it to work because I see the asthma population. Perfumes can do it. Um, incense can do it. Um, plugins can do it. It just depends. How does a parent know? You know, if you start to cough or sneeze as you get around things. Um, I had a patient the other day in the hospital who got worse when the mom came back. And so I come in the room and the kid is really worse. And the mom's like, I don't know, he's gotten worse since I got back. So I go walk up to the mom and man, I could smell her. She smelled good guys but it was way too much. And so I had to have the conversation with her about, you know, the bath and body products that every lady likes to use is sometimes not good. It can also, I've seen hair products 
So sometimes if a child is a real eczema child and their skin breaks out really easy, you like to use some of the hair products, but sometimes it could be those. And, um, and knowing that um, the strong odor aspect, the bleach aspect is for me. And then ammonia would be another one. Um, exercise can be a trigger, but I'm gonna tell you something. And I see this a lot in this population is, oh, my kid has asthma, they can't do PE or my kid has asthma and they can't go outside. Asthma is not a debilitating where they should stop doing things. Um, I met an NFL football player, Chris Draft, who has got asthma. I also met, um, I also met, uh, I, well, I didn't meet him, but the gold medalist, and he's a swimmer, he has asthma. So it should not stop a child from doing anything. I think that people just don't understand it. So that's why we're here. Respiratory infections. So guys, if you if you have this little bit of swelling, you're not doing controller meds, you're not doing things right. When you catch the flu, those kids coming in the hospital. If you have this little bit of swelling and the pollen goes up in the air and the dust when the cold fronts come through and that spikes up, a lot of these kids up, end up in the hospital because they started here when they could have started from here. So understanding the controller meds, understanding what the triggers, let's get rid of the triggers. We got rid of the triggers and my kids quit being sick. Irritants. So the irritants are things in, um, that are man-made in the environment. Uh, I can tell you, Mikey died. And, and there's, it's a book out called Mikey Died from Asthma. And Mikey was actually a kid that was young in elementary school and the buses were idling. And he it had triggered his asthma and he died. So they don't idle buses at schools anymore. I don't know if y'all know that, but... Buses cannot idle because that idling of the bus produced too many. We have 10 buses idling together. Those kids can, can, can struggle. Another thing that I saw in one of our school systems was they uh, cleaned the carpet in the library and the day before with chemicals. And the child sat for story time and ended up coming to my hospital and we ended up admitting them. So some of the things I see environmentally is like really big, strong emotions. Nobody talks about this, but if there's a, a high level stress incident in children's lives, you will see sometimes things act up. And um, um, recently one of the school nurses ended up calling me, but a child's grandfather was like his dad died and the child was wheezing a lot more. So just, just be aware of that. Sometimes you could tickle somebody or they can laugh really hard and go into a wheeze or they can cry and just getting them to calm down and take some deep breaths and do your albuterol it can get them through that. But just know that emotions and stress can play a role in what's going on. And um, I know I gotta, I'm gonna keep moving, Runa. We got past stuff I wanna share with you. Oh, I'm gonna go back. So the Breathe Project, man, the Breathe Project is good because it talks about all the things that I just told you with the triggers. And it goes over that with the patient, the, the mice and the rats. We, we have, um, a handout on pest uh, pest management in that in the uh, website. So like you don't have to go and do your research on the internet. We really tried to put it all together for you guys so that you didn't have to run everywhere. Um, I can tell you that uh, I've been to like a few conferences at N Nationwide Children's um, on asthma. I've been to a couple of the asthma allergy uh, events. I've been to the Asthma Allergy Network on Capitol Hill one year. And what I'll tell you about all these organizations and even GHHI is they basically are saying the same thing. And so this project to me endorses what everybody is saying nationally. And the questions in the brief project as you go through it are these. And so it's just really, really good. Um, the flu vaccination is mentioned and the reason they say that. And, you know, I don't get into the politics of vaccines and not. But what I will tell you is immunity plays a large role. And um, I do vac vaccinate. I do. And I have vaccinated for everything as a respiratory therapist. Um, I try to listen to the guidelines and follow them. And, um, and I, I try to encourage that. I don't push it politically, but if you try to, if you catch the flu and you're that asthmatic, your ability to be sicker is going to be there. And it will be for rhino. It will be for any of the virus, RSV, 
for corona or any other virus is it's a matter of, of swelling and irritation. Um, diet can come into play with that. And we don't mention that in the brief project, but eating green veg and lean, eating vegetables and lean, and lean meats and all is somewhat of an anti-inflammatory diet and not getting into uh, you know, more processed foods like chips and, and breads and things like that. Um, it's really good. And if children, um, the comorbidity rate for children that are overweight is high. And um, I don't like seeing it. Um, if you have a swelling in your lung and then you have a lot of weight pressing on your chest, it's just, you know, I'm overweight. So, you know, I lose a few pounds, I breathe better, but it does come into play. Comorbidity of uh, factors come into play with weight. And so I do encourage water. Water is important. And when we do an asthma camp with Brack, we do a water class because water is, is what kids don't drink and they should uh, stay away from those sugary drinks. And the water part keeps the lung moist. It keeps the snot in that lung moist so you can cough it up. And I tell my patients, I, I don't know if y'all do this, but I ask my patients to cough a couple of times before they do their MDI. I wanna move the snot out of the way so I get a better medicine deposition. And uh, what I find in the children is they don't like to cough but um, the cough is good to get the snot up. And I tell them this, if you cough it and spit it out, great. But if you swallow it, it just comes out in your bowels or your poo poo and they get a big kick out of me saying that, but we're all made the same. And so uh, that's basically um, some of the things that, that I teach them and that I try to tell them. Um, can asthma be cured? If you are a true asthmatic, you cannot be cured, but you can be controlled. And um, I know mine is very, I've done really good with controlling it. And I do am working on my eating part and my exercise. What is the goal? So what would be a goal? And the breathe project is really great because one of our questions when I ask my patient is, what would be your goal for asthma? And a lot of my mothers will say, oh, I just want them to be able to play better. Or, oh man, I just don't want to go to the emergency room as much. Because it's a very big crimp in lifestyle when the child really has a flare up and the mom can't go to work and, you know, and child can't go to school. So, you know, sometimes my patients just want to not have to deal with going to the doctor as much. So if you guys can use some of this information and we can get rid of some of the triggers in the home, maybe it would help the quality of life for that patient and that child, you know, would be able to breathe better and just have a better quality of life. Um, what does controlled asthma look like? Well, controlled asthma looks uh, symptom free, meaning that most of the time they can just do their quick relief med maybe once or twice a week, but they're fine other than that. Um, they're able to run and play like all of their friends and sleep through the night without coughing, not missing school or work, and not having to refill the quick relief med more than twice a year. So that goes, and let's see if the next slide is what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, how can a parent help their child have controlled asthma? Well, staying in touch with a doctor regular is very important. Um, and that's every three to six months. And I usually tell the mom, hey, you'll, you, know, you might go to the doctor a little bit more until they can get it in control um, and learning to work with the, and find out what are the triggers. And that may include going to the allergist. The allergist may end up with some of the injections that are monoclonal antibodies. And they're really great. One of my patients that was a frequent flyer um, ended up at the allergy office and I ran into him a while back. I said, I haven't seen you, where you been? She's like, man, my kid's a new kid. And they do an allergy injections, which actually deals with the immune system and strengthening it and they're much better. And so I was like, kudos to them because you know they got to a point where they weren't coming back so often. Um, and that is all in understanding medications. You know, just the language in part, all of us saying the same thing can help our patients. Um, and I'm hoping I get to, let's see, 
How is it diagnosed? We already talked about this, so I am going to move on. A doctor's visit with history, physical exam, and then, of course, that spirometry test we talked about. Um, the cough medicine, we talked about that one, so I'm going to go ahead and move past that. Um, when do you know to call the doctor? Well, when you've done your albuterol and it becomes worse, you need to. If you're sick enough to miss school or you have a fever of greater than 101, or if you simply cannot sleep at night because you're coughing or you're having trouble breathing, for sure you should let your doctor know. Um, and when do you go to the emergency room? Well, when the albuterol is not working, you better get there sooner rather than later. Um, I tell my patients, you're gonna do the yellow zone. And if, the yellow, if you do that yellow zone and albuterol does not last you for four hours, go to the emergency room. Um, and I tell them that just because I want them to understand the importance of going sooner rather than later. You're gonna affect the muscle around the tube, but you're not affecting the swelling inside the tube. When that patient arrives at the hospital, the first thing they'll do is give them a steroid by mouth or IV. Um, oh, I see that question. How often, um, oh, wow. Um, I understand the FMLA thing. I've, ha I've had quite a few mothers tell me that. I think it's an unfortunate thing that jobs will not work with people that have children that are sensitive. And uh, it's pretty sad that, that you have to go through all that paperwork for that. And um, I definitely have talked to a lot of moms that have had this issue of even holding a job down because of the asthma. So hopefully um, that the understanding of controller meds can come into play. The pulmonary function test, well, it should be done at the very beginning. And um, you can get one by asking your physician, like your primary care physician, you should speak to them about it. Now, my primary care, she just came in with this little bitty handheld machine. And um, I've actually used those myself in some of the school systems. We did some testing and it's just a very small machine. But if she doesn't have it or he, you need to ask them to refer you to someone. And it's not a, it's not a, a large expense to the um the insurance companies. It, it's, it's really a standard of care. It's a, it's a standard of care. Um, going to the emergency room, I would definitely not say uh, when you turn blue. I'm hoping you do it way before then because by the time you get that blue, it's not going to be good. Um, I want to encourage you not to uh, tell the population to just look at pulse oximetry. Um, I work in PICU in the emergency room by the time a pulse ox goes down, some of those kids can be pretty bad off. So pulse oximetry is not a good indicator for asthma and deciding when to go to the doctor. I think it's good that they are in our telehealth kits. The telehealth kit has the pulse ox, the peak flow meter, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, it has the um, spacer, just like this one, but there's no mask in the ones we have. It has a cell phone holder and a thermometer. So it's like a great gift. And what I've started telling people, so they'll join and complete the project, is you will get this one when, when you complete our project. So, I, I mean, we have 250 of those to send out. And, um, and they're really, it's a good thing and, and just, the information that we give our people is just really good. We need to try to turn things around in this population. The, once the PFT is done to identify your asthmatic, I think the physician does them every maybe six months. Doc, the pulmonary doctors, I think they do them at least once a year to see where that patient's at. You know, they may do it more often until they get them in control. And maybe that'll help answer your question. I'm gonna talk about how do you determine control? And it is in our book. Um, peak flow meters um, can, can be a part of the asthma life, the, but I'll, what our physicians recommend, and I do too, is just asking, how, are you, how is your breathing? Um, asking that child that. Some children don't wanna tell you, but I would just say, how's your breathing? Are you breathing okay? And I mean, I would always intervene sooner rather than later, and in any case, sooner rather than later. Um, if they fall into the red zone, for sure, they should be going to the emergency room. So it takes us to this very simple rule. And I love this rule because I like simple things. And um, the rule is this. 
you can tell whenever I say, is your asthma in control? What am I really saying? I'm saying, is the swelling in your lung in control? That's easy. Is your swelling in your lung in control? Meaning it looks like this. So the way you know it is by this simple rule and you can Google the rule of two for asthmas and it'll come up. Asthma may not be well controlled if you use a quick relief med more than twice a week. So the young man yesterday that's 35 years old who's doing albuterol three times a day is not good. And he is an asthmatic from childhood. His actually, his child I saw in the PICU yesterday. But um, we did a real simple education like this and broke it down and man, they got it. They're like, man, we got it. So they were able to have a better conversation with their doctor. That's what it's about is that they don't even know, this population doesn't know what to look for. Waking at night more than twice a month. So you went from the week treatments to waking at night in a month. And then if you have to fill the albuterol canister more than twice a year. So, you know, when I'm having to use a lot of albuterol, but I'm not on a flow vent, I got to ask myself what's going on. So having that conversation with the doctor, I tell the parents, bring the rule of two to the doctor and have the conversation. Hey, doc, um, I'm using three or four canisters in, in a year. Like, can you give me something? What would be the importance of getting the swelling down? So let's talk about this because it's down the road. If the lung remains with a lot of swelling in a person's life and they get to middle age and they creep through life, this tube can actually score and remodel. And some of the COPD patients and the patients with oxygen in their 50s is that population. So we don't want the lungs to, to remodel and to go into that. We want to prevent it. We're into preventative medicine now. And so that preventative aspect is understanding that we're going to keep the swelling down in our lungs. Um, peak flow meters come into play. And the kit that we have, I, I went up and I, I got a chance to play with their peak flow meter, but they look different, but they do the same thing. And so this is my good old friend. This one's probably seven or eight years old, but it measures the speed of air when you blow out. And basically you have to understand how to do it because there's ways you can cheat on it. And I do let the people know that because the parents especially. So the proper way to do it is sit or stand and you're gonna take a deep breath in and you wanna blow hard and fast, okay? So it kind of looks like this, <sighs> okay? And my normal number is 400. So I'm right at, but I usually do. And I always, tell a patient, do it three times, you know, three strikes you're out and take the best one. So I'm gonna do it three times. <sighs> uh, and what happens with me is I get lower and lower and I'll do it one more time. <sighs> but I want you to kind of see, <laughs> I'm really pushing to do it. So what this does is I can have this and do it every day. And I come up with a number, mine is usually 400. If I go 20% below that, it will occur before an asthma attack ever happens. Yeah, so the mom actually can be clued in on what's going on. But the cheat ways are this. The cheat way is stick your tongue and go, tuh. <coughs> you heard that? There's no way I can do that. I promise you, don't happen. The other cheat way would be, you don't put a lot of effort. <sighs> hey, ma. My pee flows down, I can't go to school. But anyway, understanding that there is a cheat way of doing it is very important and knowing how to do it. Um, the, the asthma action plan can have peak flow numbers on it. Some of them do. Um, we prefer to keep it simple and go by symptoms. So our asthma action plans are actually symptom-based. I will tell you that it should be symptom-based when it comes to pulse oximetry and deciding when to do albuterol and go to the emergency rooms. Never, never, never look at that number. And um, we are putting papers in the kits that tell our population that so no one gets into trouble. Um, let's see what else we have. Uh, the breathe home visit questions. Um, it reports the level of asthma control. And what I want to tell you about the asthma control is in the book, there is, and y'all, this is 
across the nation, they use what they call an asthma control test. And it's a questionnaire. There's one for four to 11 year olds and it has faces on it. So you can ask the child, how is your asthma? When you run and play, how is your breathing? How is your cough? How is your sleep? And the child scores it according to the faces. And so, and then the mom will answer these questions and you add it up and 19 and higher means you, you're in control. But if you're less than that, it means you're not. So you can take this and ask your patients this and screen them. And then if they're older, like greater than 11, this is the one that we use. We go up to one that is not the face oriented one. So it's really a good tool that you can use and it's used nationally. Um, so our physicians are starting to do this in their doctor's offices because maybe Jane's level of control, she'll say maybe she's a 19, but then she goes to another doctor and then that doctor, she, she, they do the test and she's saying she's a 12. Well, we're seeing that Jane's having some problems. She usually scores higher than that. So the score is like an individualized thing, but it can kind of give you a trending track of what, how the patient is. If the patient's coming into your clinic, you can do it every time and, and help them understand their asthma more, help them recognize that cough at night might be need, needed to be dealt with through their physician. Um, the quality of life issues due to asthma, you know, is very important because so many of the children, they don't let them go play outside um, and then just keep them in the house. And that's not always good. Um, it, it's just a very important thing that they, they feel like they're in control and that they have tools they can use. The, um, the allergy testing too all comes into play. I, I, I'm kind of missing something I wanna say. Let me think about, it's, it's with the BREATHE project. The BREATHE project does include the asthma control test. And so basically when you, get, when you refer that patient, I get an email and we call the patient to set up a virtual visit. We have like some of my struggle is that they don't always make the virtual. So I really have been trying hard to just say, hey, I really want to do it at your convenience and reschedule them. Um, that way they feel like, you know, it's OK because things come up, you know, um, and just things happen, jobs, children, sickness, death. So um, I do try to remake that appointment. I get an email. I look up and then I'll call and ask that patient, you know, when can we set it up? And we set it up through something called the Andor app. And it's an app for virtual visits. It sends the patient a text and an email two days before the visit to remind them, and then 10 minutes before. So two days before they get a text and an email, 10 minutes before. And it has a link that they click on their cell phone or in their computer, and then we can see each other virtual. I've done a number of visits where they can see me, but they blank their screen out. They don't want me to see them and I'm okay with that. It's just uh, easier for me to be face-to-face -face than it is to just, uh, to not see, you know, like anything, but I, I'm, I'm good to go. I just really wanna give them the information. Making a home um, asthma friendly just includes uh, having not as much carpet, but if you do a HEPA vacuum cleaner, um, is good and they're, for, they're about $49. HEPA filters, there's these room filters that are HEPA and um, we price some for about 40 bucks. And there's some bigger ones that you can put in a room and it'll, uh, it'll filter it out. Um, and then the asthma friendly ways to clean a home. That's what I didn't say, Luna. It's not using bleach, but you can use ethyl alcohol or 3% hydrogen peroxide. So guys, honestly, alcohol is a lot cheaper. You go to Dollar General and you can just wipe that countertop and it'll actually kill the COVID virus. It's not as strong of, of smell and, um, and even hydrogen peroxide. So you really can get down to some good cleaning with floors, you know, little vinegar and water because the vinegar cuts any type of grease things is kind of like what I recommend. And then um, managing, oh yeah, I love this part of the Breathe Project too. I didn't know this, so I got educated on it because uh, Colette Masser, she uh, did a project up in Washington and she told me about it. So the EPA actually came up with a project 
Um, and it actually, you can download an app and it's called Air Now. And um, I have it on my phone, I'm gonna show it to you. And you put in a zip code and it looks like this. And it gives you the air quality for your area. And it's so cool, it's free. <laughs> so, you know, the, it, the cell phones of where we're headed. And I'll just tell you that. So my air quality today where I live at is 39. If my air quality would be bad, some of the suggestions that we have is to keep, you know, don't play outside in the afternoon because it'll go up even higher. And then closing your windows and recirculating the air. So a lot of times people don't understand that air quality aspect, but it does play a huge role of, uh, of what's going on um, for that asthma patient. And on those poor air quality days, understanding what to do. It's simple. It's really not hard. Um, I even suggest with parents making sure your windows are rolled up during the high pollen times, which is right now. Um, a lot of my parents will tell me, hey, my child gets sick every time the weather changes. And so what I would address that is when um, when there's a weather change and a meaning a cold front's coming, the winds pick up. And when those winds pick up, you'll see a higher dust and pollen count. If that patient is willing to wear a mask, it's really a good thing. Um, during the pandemic, we had very little asthmatics come in. And the reason is, is because they were not in schools handing the virus to each other, the cold virus, RSV. Um, they also were wearing masks out in, in, in the public. So they weren't giving the germs to each other, viruses. And then the pollen aspect. It's very okay to wear masks if you're an asthmatic and you're in some season change. And maybe people don't want to hear it, but it really can make a difference in the trigger aspect and what you get um, in, into your breathing system. So um, managing the indoor environment. And this is one of the best practices and actions to step in your home. All of these brochures are in the Breathe Project. Like this project has been like really ongoing and really today really makes me sh see how much we pull together. And um, it's all for you guys to bring back to the public and to really make a difference in this population. Um, combustion byproducts. So one of the questions too that we talk about is, do you have a gas stove or an electric stove? Um, do you have uh, a vent over your stove? Hopefully they are I'll have vents, but in some cases I've met some that they don't. So opening a window up in that kitchen could be a very good thing. Um, also, you know, keeping the uh, vent in your bathroom so the moisture stays down in there is a good thing. So this sheet right here is very good and it is part of uh, our project. And, and I just so pass that on to you guys. I think like the furry pets is of course the dander aspect of those animals um, come into play. But I, I think I've addressed most, does anybody have questions when it comes to parts of the home and triggers? Does anybody have any questions left? All right, I went over all this. I'm sorry, Runa, I, I think I got ahead of my slides. Um, the question, there is a hotline that you guys can recommend and it's there and a link. And um, we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't do the home inspection, but we do do homes as far as giving tips on how to get it better. Does anybody um, have any other questions on any, anything that I've mentioned? It's a lot of information. If you need to contact me, um, I'm at Our Lady of the Lake Children's Hospital. And um, my number is 225-439-1883. And I'll type it into the comments. Um, I, I'm always, I always try to be available and, uh, and just interested in what I do. So I just put that in. And uh, oh, the app on my phone, Air, I'm gonna type it in. Air Now is the app and it's an EPA app. We have a little quiz for you guys. The other thing I'm gonna just leave you with is um, across the nation, there's not a technical certification for community health workers. There is an asthma education certification that, that, um, that is out there. 
And what it requires is it requires it's it's for physicians or doctors, social workers. Um, it can be respiratory therapists, um, pharmacists. If you're working with asthma greater than 1,200 hours a week, you present that to the board. The NA, it's a National Asthma Education Certification Board, and then they give you an approval to take that test. Um, the test, it, it's a hard test. It, I think it's like a 60% pass rate first time around. But what I, I tell you I'm excited about is I am in, in conversation with some organizations that want to come up with a community health worker certification and, um, and have that nationally. It hasn't happened yet. If it does happen, my push is that it can be affordable and that it can be something that's not so hard to keep, keep uh, but something that we offer you guys. And it, it's just... Uh, something that I think is necessary, that would be good. And I'm really cheering for all the community health workers. And thank you so much for all the work you do. I'm finished, Runa. I think I finished all the slides, did I? Except the, the quiz. You yes, have a quiz. I just put the quiz link in the chat box so everybody has access to it. Um, I don't, I clicked on it so you can see what it looks like. So let me share my screen real quick. I know we're at the top of the hour um, and the quiz can be taken anytime. If you want to sort of revisit this whole presentation and then take the quiz, that's fine too. Um, but, in, you know, initially it's gonna ask you for some information. Um, please, please, please put in your email address because this is where your certificate of completion will be emailed. And once you enter this information and you click submit, it will take you to the actual quiz. Um, there are 20 questions and uh, you need to um, get 17 of them correct to pass, but then you can definitely retake the quiz as many times as you want. Um, and thank you so much, Tracy, amazing presentation. Guys, she is such an asset to this program. I cannot be uh, I'm more grateful to her. Um, and thanks everybody for joining. We had a great turnout today. Um, any questions um, before we close? I have to say as a person with lifelong asthma, I learned a lot today and uh, <laughs> It kind of sounded like a lot of people um, for just looking at the chats, maybe have asthma or have kids with asthma and then definitely looks like a lot of us learned a lot. So thank you, Tracy. Um, any questions at all, I will put our email in the chat box. It is simply breathe at la.gov. Please do not hesitate to send us an email anytime. I'll also put my own personal email in the chat box. It is just runa.bakshi at la.gov. And if there are questions that I cannot answer, I am happy to pass it on to Tracy or whoever is the best person. Um, and I'm really hoping that uh, this whole uh, yeah. effort um, can uh, help more, more people receive care. Uh, and I'm and I'm still seeing a, a lot of uh, grateful comments coming into the chat box. Um, I'm going to put in the link to the quiz was emailed this morning. It is also in the chat box. Um, go ahead and take that quiz, and your certificate will be emailed to you within one week. Um, I will keep the call open for the next two minutes until 12:05. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. If not, um, please feel free to sign off. I will now stop the recording.